So now we'll talk about a statistical test that is very closely related to correlation, um, but you can use it to uh, for prediction. Um, overall, uh, the strategy is called regression, and we're going to start with simple regression. Uh, but after we're done with simple regression, we'll talk about what's called multiple regression. And multiple regression um, is one of the most useful statistical uh, techniques that there are. Uh, so it's like used in the business world, it's used by scientists, it's really uh, a powerful technique. But we'll start out with the simple version, right? Uh, so you use simple regression when you have one predictor variable and one outcome variable. And the thing that makes it simple is that you have one predictor variable. If you had more than one predictor, you'd be doing multiple regression. Um, and so the outcome variable should be interval or ratio scale of measure. Uh, the predictor variable doesn't need to be. It can actually be um, any scale of measure, uh, and it would work out OK. So, for example, we might have a, we might think that uh, how m much uh, students study will predict will predict uh, exam grades. Right. So, students that study more hours for an exam would get better grades. Uh, and the null hypothesis here would be that there's nothing happening, right? So in that case, um, the our studying is unrelated to or does not predict exam grades. Uh, so uh, I'll say studying, oops, studying does not predict exam grades. All right, and usually I would have written this null hypothesis with population parameter symbols. Um, but since I haven't introduced enough material yet for this regression, we're going to come back to what these null hypotheses look like um, in a little bit. All right, so let's consider an example. Um, let's say we have, uh, we ask uh, students, 10 of them, how many um, hours they studied for the exam. So we'll put that on the bottom here. We'll call it X, and this will be the hours studied, the number of hours they studied for the exam, and we'll call uh, this Y, this is the outcome, uh, and this is exam scores. And let's say our results fit our intuitions, right, where the more uh, students studied, the better exam grades they got. So we'll say there's 10 students, right, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right, so this is a student who studied a lot, let's say this goes uh, from zero to 100%, so this, has got, this is about 100 here. We'll say the number of hours goes from zero to 10, right? So this is a student who studied, I don't know, nine and a half hours and got, I don't know, 99, 100%, really did really well on the exam, right? And this person down here studied maybe like one hour and failed the exam, right? Um, and so far, this looks a lot like correlation. And we could actually calculate the correlation coefficient of this uh, data. Um, but now we want to switch from just telling if there's a, a relationship between the two uh, to using regression. And regression is going to do a little bit more than correlation can. Right? So, because um, it's going to allow us to predict people's scores on exams. So, if this is what our data looks like, and we um, run our data through our statistical program, right, what it's going to do is it's going to tell us the line that best fits through all of that data. This is the, uh, the best fit line, uh, also, also known as the regression line, right? And so this line, what we can do with it once we have it, is if an 11th student shows up, 11th student shows up? Yeah. And they've studied for five hours, given the data that we had from our first 10 students, we can predict that student is going to get about maybe like an 80 percent, right? And that's how this regression is going to allow us to predict uh, future observations based on some previous observations that we already have. So you probably remember from high school 
the equation y equals mx plus b, right? So this is the equation uh, for a line. And in regression, we have a line. And so statisticians actually use this same formula, but of course, that make things more complicated, right? They relabel everything, right? So this back in the day, was this was the, the slope. Right? Remember, that was the, the rise over the run. Uh, the rise is like how much the, the change is this way for each change going across. All right, so that was the slope. And this, that was the intercept. That's where the line crossed over here. All right. Um, but now that we're in statistics, right, I think this might have been algebra, but now what we're going to do is we're going to switch this up a little bit. But the ideas are exactly the same. And call this y hat, cute little hat there, right? So this means it's going to be a predicted value rather than an observed value. It's going to equal a plus bx. So a is now the intercept, right? So whoop, and B is now the slope. But otherwise, they're exactly the same as they used to be, right? So this is still rise over run, and this is still the intercept at the vertical axis, right? Um, and so whenever you do a regression uh, analysis, um, the result is one of these prediction equations. Um, so you're always, when you do a regression, uh, fitting lines to the data uh, and that enables you to create this equation and predict future scores. All right, so for this particular data set, we'll say we uh, run our uh, data through um, regression analysis, and we get our prediction equation. All right, so that's gonna be one of these equations, except for we're actually gonna have the intercept value and the slope value that fits our observed data. Right, and so um, for this, it's going to be something like, this is a, a pretty approximate uh, set of slope and intercept values, so I just eyeballed that based on this, right? And so the way, this, the way I was able to do that is to find out what the intercept is. That's the value for uh, uh, the exam scores when x equals zero, right? So if you plug zero in, doesn't even matter what the slope is because this is all going to be zero. So here, this is all gone. And whatever y is, when x equals zero, that's your intercept. And so here, I guess that's about 20. All right, so that's how I figured out what the intercept was here. And the slope, remember the slope, right, that's rise over run. All right, so that's how much change in the outcome variable there is per one change in x, right? Um, but we can actually set multi like a different value for x. So what I did is I saw that x changes across from 0 to 10, right? And so I wanted to, just to simplify it, I went across all, all 10. And for all that big change, how much did y change? It went from about 20 to about 100. So for every, cha every 10 change in Hours studied, there was 80 change in exam score, right? So 80 divided by 10 is 8. That's where this 8 came from. So if we come back here, what we can see is for somebody that studied 0 hours compared to somebody that studied 1, so x changed by 1, y changed by 8. So that's the, the rise over the run. 8 divided by 1 is our slope. All right, um, but you could directly interpret the slope in terms of the actual variables. So if I'm telling my future class how much studying helps, I would say, well, for every hour you study, you're probably going to get about eight more points on your exam. So if you study about 10 hours, you're probably going to get about 100 on there. That's usually what people did in the past. If you studied, let's say, eight hours, well, we could just plug that in. Let's see. If you study eight hours, and it's 8 times 8 plus 20 will be our predicted y value. So that's 64 plus 20. Well, if you study 8 hours, I'm going to predict you probably get about an 84 on the exam. Because in the past, that's the kind of scores people got. So this is how you can use reg simple regression to predict 
one variable uh, from another. So any new person that comes in, given the data we already have, if they tell us how much they studied, uh, that's their x value, right? That's across the bottom. We could plug that in, and then we could predict their uh, score on the exam. So what makes this line the best fitting line, right? So um, how does SPSS or whatever is doing your calculations for you know that this is the best line and not one that's a little bit more this way or a little bit more this way? What makes this one the exact best? Um, and what it is is this is the line that minimizes the error in predicting y from x. Right? So this is the x score, and this is how far off the prediction was for the score. And this is how far off the prediction of the y score was for the x. Right? So for each of these, these are the errors in prediction based on the observed data. So this is this line is the best line to reduce it. So if you rotate this line, these errors get bigger. They get further. Uh, the, the prediction line gets further away from the points on average. So the best fit line is the one that minimizes the um, error in prediction of y from x. So it's not just the difference score um, because generally half these different scores are going to be positive and negative, right? And so just like when we did the, the variance, standard deviation in the past, we're going to square these different scores and we're going to end up with a, a sums of squares here, right? So this sums of squares is going to be um, the observed y minus the predicted y value for uh, each score and we'll square that to turn them all positive. So for this one, for example, right, the actual observed y is where this green is. So maybe that was 98. Um, and the predicted y is wherever this line is. So that looks like it might be 100. So in that case, you would take 98 minus 100 and square them, right? And you do that for each 10 people, for each 10 observations. You add them all up, and that's the sums of squares error. This is the error in prediction. This is the sums of squares associated with error. This is the inaccuracy in our regression equations, predictions of y scores from, from x scores. So the best fit line minimizes the sums of squares error. Right, so the, the, the regression line is the best line for predicting. It's the one that has the least amount of error uh, in predicting scores based on the observed scores. In regression, there's an overall amount of sums of squares a sum of squares total, just like there was for like ANOVA or even calculating the, the, the variance, right? And so the sum of squares uh, total, this is how much variation there is in Y, right? So this is how much error there is in predicting Y. And sum of squares total, this is the total amount of variation in Y that could be explained by X, right? Um, and so the sum of squares total for Y is just y, all 10 y scores, right, minus the average y score squared. So this is just the regular old, that's not an x, that's a y, this is the regular old sums of squares, right? And that just tells us how much variation there is across y scores, just the total amount of variation that could possibly ex be explained. Um, and now that we have these two types of sums of squares, what we can calculate is how much variation in the outcome variable is explained by this line here, right? Um, and we'll call that the sums of squares regression. And it's equal to the sums of squares total, all, all the variation that could be explained, minus the sums of squares error, the variation in y that's still unexplained, right? So this will tell us, this here will tell us how much our regression explains the variation in y. And so if we actually calculate the sums of squares regression divided by the sums of squares total, this is how much of all the variation that exists in the outcome variable, how much of that variation, what percent of it or proportion is explained by the line. And so if your sums of square, if your regression explained all the variation 
in Y, these would be the same. It'd be something, I don't know, we'll say 500 divided by 500. All of it's explained. In that case, you get a 1. A 1 is the maximum value. If the line doesn't fit at all, if it's not, if, if your predictor doesn't explain any of your outcome variable, if these two variables are uncorrelated, then your sums of squares error and sums of squares total are going to be the same, and your sums of squares regression is going to be zero. And in that case, the worst case scenario, um, the result of this uh, formula would be a zero. Right? And so this is called R squared. And if you remember from ANOVA, we had something called eta squared. And eta squared and R squared are exactly the same, conceptually. They're both the sums of squares total on the bottom, and in the top is the sums of squares explained by the relevant variable. And in this case, it's the number of hours studied. So remember, eta squared and r squared, they're both the same. They both have a maximum of 1 if the variable explains all the variation in the outcome variable, or a value of 0 if they don't explain the outcome variable at all. And so for simple regression, the r squared is the, that's the effect size. So we've been working with what are called unstandardized coefficients. Right, so um, we said that the predicted value of y equals the, uh, the intercept on the uh, vertical axis, the y-intercept, plus the slope times your x value. And for this example, we said that looked like, like that. Um, right, so here we said, for, for this, A equals 20 and B equals 8. Uh, so next I want to talk about something called standardized coefficients. Standardized And this might make you think standard deviations, and if so, uh, that's good because standard deviations are involved. Um, but really, these standardized coefficients are another way of looking at this exact same um, equation, and this exact same data, um, but it's a little bit more a, a general approach, I would say. All right, so um, for these standardized coefficients, you don't actually predict the Y score, instead you predict the Z score for Y. So what you actually do for these standardized coefficients is you do a Z score transformation on all of the exam scores, a Z score transformation on all of your predictor variable scores, your, how many hours you studied, and you run the regression on those standardized, those Z score transformed variables. And so over here, we're going to have, for exam scores, it's going to be, we'll say, Z for exam scores. And down here, it's going to be the Z scores for um, the number of hours you studied. Right, so remember, a, a Z score is just the actual score uh, minus the mean of that variable uh, divided by the standard deviation for that variable, right? So um, the, the mean score uh, for our studied, right, would have a z-score of zero because it'd be the same as the mean. All right, so this would be the formula to, to change these raw hours studied into the z-scores for x, right? And for y, we take each y-score, subtract from it the mean of the y divided by the standard deviation of the y, right? So these are um, the familiar z-score formula that we've been working with all semester. Uh, but now what we're doing is we're transforming our predictor variable and our outcome variable before we're running our regression. And if you do that, what we're predicting now is a z-score for y. 
and you actually don't have, uh, well, there, there's always an intercept, but in this case, the intercept, once you've done a z-score transformation, the intercept is always zero, so that just drops out of the equation. And b is now written as beta. So this is the first case where the Greek letter uh, doesn't refer to a population parameter and the Latin letter um, to a sample statistic. Um, beta refers to the standardized coefficient, b to the unstandardized coefficient. All right, so here we have predicting the z-score for y with our standardized coefficient, and we need to plug in, rather than a raw x-value, the z-score for our x-value. So it's a slightly simplified formula, right? And so now what this beta is, right, is the rise over the run still, so it's the change in the z-score for y for each change in the z-score for x. So if you, uh, if you compare, so if this is zero, right, the mean of um, x, if you go up one standard deviation here, how many standard deviations do you go up for your y? And in this case, my guess is it's going to be about, beta is going to be about dot 9. And if these two were perfectly correlated, if there is no error in this prediction at all, beta is 1. And notice if this were going down, if it were a, um, a negative correlation, and if there was no error in the prediction there, then beta would be negative 1. All right, so a perfect prediction in a negative way, a negative association, negative 1, perfect prediction in, in the positive um, direction is a, a plus 1. So that's exactly the same limits as a correlation coefficient has. And in fact, for simple regression only, your beta is the same as the correlation coefficient. So you can use, for simple regression, you can run a, a simple regression on two variables. SPSS will tell you what the beta is. And that beta is exactly the same as if you did those exact same variables and did the correlation. Right? So the correlation equals beta for simple regression. They're exactly the same as one another. All right, so uh, I drew the standardized regression coefficient uh, equation, the standardized regression e equation, uh, but I didn't fill it in, so I'm going to do that here. This should actually be the predicted value for y. So here we got the z-score for the predicted value y equals, now we actually have our beta, so that's dot nine, and this is the x, right? So if we want to figure out a predicted z-score for exam scores, we plug in a z-score for the number of hours studied. And so when you're actually doing prediction, you almost always use this formula because you're interested in exam scores. That's the interpretable unit for this kind of data. But to get a better sense of how strongly related two variables are, you often use a, a beta because correlation coefficients are something that people tend to understand pretty well. They have a maximum of one, minimum of negative one, zero is unrelated. So correlation coefficients are nice, they're intuitive, people get a pretty good sense of what those mean. So for interpreting the relationship between these two variables, a, the beta, or an r, is really nice, right? So notice this constraint, the, the, the plus one to the negative one for the correlation coefficient, or beta equivalently, right? That makes it intuitive when you think about a b, a b is not all that intuitive. So if you do 10 different regressions on 10 different pairs of variables, B could vary widely. So if you're working with um, numbers that are like .0015 is your, like if it's like reaction time in milliseconds, your B value could be something like like you know .00023. It's a super tiny number. Or if you're working in incomes, right, your your B value could be a huge number. It could be like a thousand. So B values, there's no limit on their range. It's just determined by whatever the variables are like that you're using. That makes them hard to compare across 10 different pairs 
of analysis, like ten, the relationship across 10 different variable pairs, right? Because sometimes they could be, a, a B could be a tiny number, sometimes a B could be a huge number. But for all of those 10 simple regressions, if you look at the beta, you'll be able to directly compare them. And whichever ones have the strongest absolute value, right, the, 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 large, the closest to one or negative one, those are the variables who have the strongest relationship. All right, so betas, or R's equivalently for simple regression, are much easier to interpret and compare across analyses than B values are. Uh, so that's one thing that makes these standardized coefficients really useful is you could compare uh, apples to oranges. All right, so uh, beta values, standardized coefficients, and B values, unstandardized coefficients, um, are mathematically related to each other, like directly, um, and you can actually transform one into the other pretty easily. Um, and if you remember what a beta is, it's for each change, the, the amount of change in the z-score for the y variable, the outcome variable, for each change in the z-score for the predictor variable, right? So these are z-scores, right? And, and b values are in raw scores. And remember, a, a z-score, if I just kind of put the formula in here, right? It's y minus uh, the mean of y divided by the standard deviation of y. That's not kind of on the top. And on the bottom, it's x minus the, the mean of x divided by the standard deviation of x. Right, so if we want to turn these from standard deviation units back into hours and scores, we need to get rid of these standard deviations on the bottom. You take a beta value and multiply it by the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. And so what that does is it basically cancels out those two, leaving you with the original units that you had before. And so if you just take a beta value and multiply it by the ratio of those two standard deviations, you get your B value back, you get your unstandardized coefficient back. You go from units of standard deviation to the original units, uh, scores per hour uh, studied. Sorry, so this equals B. Um, so you can transform these pretty easily back and forth, although in practice you wouldn't need to do it. Because if you do a simple regression in any statistical program like SPSS, it's going to tell you what A is, it's going to tell you what B is, and it's going to tell you what your beta is. Those are just part of the outputs. So you don't actually need to mathematically transform these because SPSS will tell you all of them uh, automatically. It's a default part of the output of the statistical programs that we use. All right, so next I want to talk about some uh, limitations. I'm calling that some limitations of simple regression. Um, I'll talk about three. And the first one is that with regular regression, the way I've described it, you can only detect linear relationships amongst your variables, right? So okay, if you can fit a straight line, that's all it can do. It can't handle. the kind of relationship you get when you have performance and arousal. For example, right here, people that are under aroused don't perform well, over aroused don't perform well, but there's an optimal level of arousal. Um, so the, the basic version of regression can't handle this, although there's a more advanced techniques where you can transform these variables before you do the uh, regression, and you can detect nonlinear relationships with that, um, but not for the version that we've talked about uh, here. Another limitation is that uh, just because one variable predicts another doesn't mean the predictor variable is causing a change in your outcome variable. Uh, this is the same exact concern we talked about for correlations. And really, you could think about simple regression as a type of uh, correlation, or you could think of correlation as a type of simple regression because ultimately um, they're the same thing when you have a, a standardized beta and a correlation coefficient, or the exact same thing, right? So. I, in some ways, they like directly change into one another. Um, and so you don't know 
if A is causing B, B is causing A, or if a third variable is causing the change in both. And the third uh, thing that I'm going to call limitation um, is called regression to the mean. And um, first of all, illustrate it, and then I'll, I'll tell just a little bit about the history of this idea, right? Because this is why this technique is called regression, right? So it's kind of important to understand why it's called a regression to understand what's going on here. So uh, well, let's consider a situation here where um, there's a correlation between two variables. It's a very strong positive correlation, correlated dot eight five. That means the beta between the two variables is dot eight five, right? And here's the prediction equation for standardized coefficients, right? So all we're going to do is put our beta dot eight five in here, right? And then we can plug in whatever we want for our, our z-score for x, and that'll give us our z-score predicted for y, right? So if we put a 2 in here, 2 times dot 8, 5 is 1.7, right? Um, if you put a, a 1, uh, if you put a 1 in here, right, then you get dot 8, 5, put a 0, there's nothing over here, you get a 0 for the predicted y value. Um, and if you put a negative 1 in, you get a negative dot 8.5, negative 2, you get negative dot 1.7, right? So no, nothing too surprising here, but what I want to point out is that the predictor variable is further from its own mean than is the predicted value, right? So, so this score here is two standard deviations away from the mean, whereas this one is only 1.7 standard deviations away. So the outcome variable that's being predicted is always closer to the mean than the predictor variable. And so that's called regressing towards the mean. Um, and historically, this was uh, identified in actual data by the person who invented the, the correlation, um, the first version of it anyway, uh, who was Sir Francis Galton, uh, Charles Darwin's cousin. And what he was looking at is IQ in family, so like parents and kids. And what he found out is if he used parents' IQ to predict their kids' IQ, if the parents were really extreme, really intelligent or really unintelligent, either way, their kids tended to be closer to the average intelligence. So it turns out that this regression to the mean, not only does it like happen when we use our equation, but it actually is a phenomenon that happens in the real world, where if you use more extreme predictors, you pretty much always get less extreme actual outcomes in the world. So if two tall people have a kid, or have a bunch of kids, those kids will tend to be shorter than the two parents. Or if two really short people have kids, their kids on average will be taller than the parents. They'll be towards the average of the population. So extreme predictors end up having less extreme uh, outcomes. Uh, unless you have a perfect correlation of one, which in practice um, doesn't really happen.